The Threading Commission podcast is a spirited discussion with myself and a couple of my long-term colleagues in the profession. Our discussions are based solely on our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions or views of our employers, the American Planning Association, or even our alma mater. So grab a seat in the back of City Hall, dig out an old copy of Robert's Rules, and for goodness sakes, read your packet. The Planning Commission is now in session. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another fine episode. Well, we hope it's a fine one, right, of the Planning Commission podcast. Man, do we have a treat in store for you today. I'm I'm excited about this. All of us are excited about this. Uh, we have a special guest uh, that's going to just, I think, knock your socks off when it comes to everything about zoning. So the title of this episode, Zoning is a House of Cards. And even that ain't allowed in R1. So we're going to hit all over this zoning topic and what it has done to America, what it has meant to affordable or any kind of housing, really. Uh, the brain drain that has occurred in our major areas uh, because of zoning. And gosh, we could probably talk for about four or five hours on the subject, but we will limit it to uh, at least just today, half an hour or so of your time. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I want to start by asking my fellow commissioners, first of all, welcome commissioners. It's good to see your friendly faces again. Great to be back. Hi. <laughs> yes. Present. All right. Present. Yes, we're all here. <laughs> what are your impressions of zoning? The three of us have 50 plus years of time. And we've been, I think, I mean, arguably most of us have been, I have been more in the transportation realm, but it's impossible to not be involved in land use, right? Land, I am always a little bit believer that the best transportation planning starts with fantastic land use planning. And if we don't get that right, then we're screwed. So uh, your impressions between the two of you, uh, what's your, what has zoning meant to your career? Things that you've seen, maybe stories you could share with our maybe six or seven listeners that we've grown to um, that sort of illustrate or, or maybe just hit you upside the head at one point about this crazy thing that we call zoning. Jess, do you have any initial thoughts on that? Yeah, right away. So um, again, up in Alaska, I, I was working at the county, so we did have a zoning code. And what I had to do a lot was explain to people that we did have zoning because a lot of folks would come into a public meeting or they would come to a, 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 a board or a commission. They would say, we don't have zoning this is, this is, this is Alaska. We don't have zoning. We're free here. It's the last frontier. And I was like, freedom. No, yes. <laughs> we do have zoning. It's just over the entire borough. It was set a, a general use district is what it was called. And, and, and then how, we had remind everybody how big that borough was. Oh, it's the size of Ireland. I mean, it's huge. Um, <laughs> or West Virginia, if you don't know what Ireland looks like, but um, I don't, those are the two that we would use. We'd be like, it's the size of Ireland and the population was 8,000 moose. So what was really interesting though, is that we had seven conditional use permits and that's how we dealt with things that popped up out oh, where yeah. we were. Yeah. Like cell phone towers, um, marijuana dispensaries. Let's see what else was one. The moose need their uh, weed. I, you have to have a little yeah. something. Well, yeah. So, it, yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that was kind of my first smack in the face about it is people keep telling me we don't have zoning. And I'm like, we do, because what they were using it as, is as an excuse to do whatever they wanted in their, in their front yard, you know, like, I don't know, <laughs> pump out tons and tons of polluted, horrible, um, I, you know, like this kind of smoke that was really messing up some air quality issues and things. And I feel like I'm going to live to regret that statement. So I'm just going to stop now, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like you could get away with a lot in Alaska, you know, like the Dr. Seuss house that I saw from, oh, a distance. Yeah. You know, I talk about it. Oh, a, the doctor. I mean, oh, yeah, that's famous. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to know how many of the HOAs truly allow Tyvek as your uh, exterior <laughs> siding because that, that seems that's to be an about actual a third. siding type. Yeah, yeah yes, you know, they yeah. say you built your house dollar per dollar. For Design every review dollar. approves the Tyvek. <laughs> yeah, they're like, <laughs> yeah, you got a two year, you know, time limit on that. So, absolutely. Oh how about you, Don? What's your you're the longest in the tooth of the three of us. Boy, What's your impressions? I, I was going to go on the health, safety, and general welfare. Oh, angle, yeah. But yeah. but but the more I thought about it, I, I'm going to tie this back to 
anybody who knows me knows I'm not a fan of state DOTs and I think they should be <laughs> out of cities altogether. And, there, you and, said it for, for you yeah, said it publicly yeah. officially. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I thought back to a time that kind of kickstarted that and it was related to this issue of zoning. I was doing what was called a community impact assessment uh, in North Carolina for mm -hmm. the DOT for a new interchange that was planned. And with my background in traffic and transportation, I'm looking at this thing going, wait a minute, your forecasts for traffic range between 10,000 a day and 20,000 a day. So how are you making it? You can't even make a determination of the number of lanes you think you want. Well, we base those land use assumptions on the, on the zoning. Okay, I mean, okay, I'll look into that. And kind of what you said, Jess, this was in a kind of an ex-urban area. It was a county that loved approving urban scale development, but didn't want to do like sidewalks and other things that come with urban scale development. And I get into it and they have open use zoning, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. same as out there. And I'm going, so wait a minute, <clears throat> we, we've basically given the DOT a narrative to do whatever they want. Oh, we base it on the land use and the zoning. Well, the zoning is open use. What yeah. predictability is there in that? It's so I called a crystal ball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we well, have one. So <laughs> naive me said, well, if we can't even define what the project could be from a configuration standpoint, maybe the DOT should engage with the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the county to do a little bit of scenario planning in this sub area to refine it. And when I got the comments back on the draft report from North Carolina DOT, no, take that out. We don't do that. <laughs> and I'm sitting here going, crappy zoning is yielding a $20 million investment. And it's all based on that house of cards that you talked about. Yet we're representing the public and making this decision. We are being stewards of the public money in making this mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. And none of it was credible in my opinion. I feel like yeah. planning school ought to have a class entitled House of Cards. How, <laughs> you know, planning, it's just such a, there's so many ways that we use that term that, you know, we've talked about with like the, the travel demand forecast model, which is a very techie thing, but it's definitely the backbone of so much traffic engineering in this country. And it's like, oh my gosh, do you have no idea how mm. flawed that thing is, you know? So I, I've got a couple of examples, I think that take it really home. One is, you know, as, as, a, as a commissioner myself, I, I feel so bad for the public who comes in and testifies uh, in either for or against a project. And I'll give you an example. Our own code here in Boise, we have a zoning code called neighborhood office. Well, mm -hmm. what do you think would be the type of land use that goes in neighborhood office? I don't know. Small scale office? Yeah. Maybe small, a yeah. neighborhood? <laughs> yeah, one would think, right? As a layman public, one would probably assume, okay, neighborhood, smaller scale, office, white collar. Yeah, okay. We're I not talking an interchange that. business no, park. No, no. But, it's like but a, do you know an attorney it's that works out of his basement, right? Like, <laughs> Right, exactly, right. My, my CPA, right? Okay. Mm, mm. But do you know what is permitted? Up to 20 units, I think it's at least 20 units per acre of apartments, which fine, we need that, no problem. But my point okay. is, is that what, how is that in that code? And my broader picture of this is like, if even an us who are trained on this stuff, sometimes you're just like, oh my gosh, it's so confusing. How on earth, how on earth is the public supposed to be expected to know all the intricacies of a zoning ordinances that, that was you know, written 40 years ago and has and has taken on a Frankenstein monster look because of all the changes that have been made from year to year, right? So that's one thing. The other thing before we get into our, our whiskey pairing here is a few years ago, I had I sent myself down to some training down in Berkeley, California, or actually it was Oakland, pardon me. Uh, Berkeley is is one of the birthplaces of zoning, though, a um, mm -hmm. hundred and something years ago. And in this class, I sat next to there was a person I started to talk with and her and her husband lived there. And between the two of them, I think she had mentioned that they made two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars a year. And this was seven years ago or something. And both of them had master's degrees from Harvard. And you know what she was asking me? How's the housing market in Boise? 
<laughs> because she's flat out said, I can't, we can't afford to live here. They had no kids, just the two of them making a third of a million dollars almost with Harvard degrees. And yet that city and that region couldn't retain that incredible brain power, young, enthusiastic, you know, and I think that that's a, a huge piece of what we miss in this country about the, the implications of zoning, the housing and the affordability piece is, is obviously there, but uh, the, the brain drain, which is what we'll get into in a minute with our fabulous guest, um, is also another prominent theme and, and an unintended consequence, I think, uh, of what zoning in America has done. So first things up, though, Don, whiskey pairing, what goes with House of Cards zoning and this wonderful discussion we're about to have? <laughs> this might be offensive to our Kentucky native guests today, and so <laughs> I, I had to go a different direction. I'm going with George Dickel white corn whiskey. And there's oh, a couple new. of reasons for that. One, much like the subdivisions that result from zoning, it has no character. It has no maturity <laughs> in its taste. And it's really white. Yeah. yeah. I get it. Well, I'm, I'm probably it. probably going a little farther on yeah, this, but yeah, yeah. what we know about the segregationist history yeah. of line. zoning, oh, we've got gosh. it right there. So uh George Dickel White. This just in. Still looking for sponsors. George Dickel <laughs> calling. George Dickel. Um, love. I did a tour of the Dickel Distillery and enjoyed it quite a bit. That was and the actually... tour, the tour guide was about as bland as the bot, the whiskey <laughs> oh my bottle that I was. You are killing any chance Jeez. you might have at at least getting a, a free bottle of something, man. Their rye now we know is really Don... good. I have a glad bottle of their rye over there. It's fantastic. So well, we they're, just know Don doesn't safe. do it for the money, Chris. He does not do it yes, for the money. It so isn't. that makes okay. him pure of heart. <laughs> all right. Well, with all of these three monkeys listening and preaching into your ear, we're going to turn it over to a real planner who knows a whole lot more than, than <laughs> we do. We are super thrilled to have with us on the Planning Commission podcast, Mr. Nolan Gray, who is currently the research director for Yimby, California. And we're going to learn about what Yimby is in just a minute, if you're not familiar with that. Uh, but also, he is the author of a phenomenal book that I am a firm believer ought to be required reading for any planner in this country, frankly. Um, and it's called Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. And since we do have video as well, showing a little picture of it, get it in your local bookstore or Amazon or whatever other method that you might have for getting books. Mr. Nolan Gray, thank you for joining the Planning Commission podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we like to just dive right in and let you do the talk and we've done enough. So give us your, uh, your sort of quickopedia, you know, uh, sort of overview of your career. How did you get to where you are today? You know, the highlights and, and definitely how did you become so interested in zoning that you felt compelled enough to write a book about it? Um, and really examine this. And and we'll get into the book, of course, and concepts, but tell us your story. Yeah, I mean, what do you, zoning's not an exciting topic that people don't right. just love to talk about. Um, now, I always joke, I mean, when I first started getting interested in zoning, it was the type of thing where if you bring it up at a party, the other person would <laughs> politely have to use the bathroom or go fill up their drink, right? <laughs> um, you know, now we're in a special moment where a lot of people are really interested in zoning, actually, weirdly enough, right? I mean, you can't open the editorial pages of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal without seeing something about zoning. Uh, certainly, local politics now are just overwhelmingly shaped by it as we've kind of, you know, slept walk our way into a uh, affordable housing crisis. Uh, and I mean, now it even came up in the presidential election, right? I mean, I'm not, the, the quality of the discourse wasn't exactly where we might like it to be, right? But so zoning has become this, this national uh, issue. My background was, uh, I'm a trained professional city planner, uh, did my planning uh, studies at Rutgers, uh, worked in New York City as a professional city planner, um, and just started getting interested in this issue as it struck me that this was a space where there was a lot of reform energy. Uh, there were a lot of people paying attention to this and, and actually thinking in a really deep, uh, sophisticated way about how we need to change the way we plan cities. And then, of course, just all of the knock on effects of uh, the current policy, uh, you know, as we can get into over the course of this conversation, housing affordability issues, uh, racial equity, 
and sustainability, economic opportunity, all this stuff seemed to flow out of zoning. And so I just became much more fascinated in it. Uh, currently finishing up a PhD in city planning at UCLA and coming out to California, got me involved in some of the really exciting work we're doing out here. And now I'm at California EMB, helping them craft uh, state legislation uh, that will hopefully uh, clear away some of these barriers to housing production uh, and make California an affordable place, not just a place where we just send all of our people to uh, uh, Boise, Idaho, uh, or uh, you know Phoenix, Arizona. Most definitely. Wow. So Nolan, I want to know if you could put together the curriculum for a would-be mm. planner or even a new planner now, freshly minted, going to work. What do they need to know about zoning, and and how would you teach that? That's a really great question. You know, I when I got my planning degree at Rutgers is an amazing program. Can't recommend it strongly enough. But you you did not have to take a zoning class to get your planning degree. Hmm. Uh, I took a I took a volunteer. It was like you know one of these classes where it's like topics in topics in physical planning colon zoning, and it was like <laughs> me and like eight other people who voluntarily opted into the class. I was talking to the professor and she was like, oh, well, I got, it's no longer special topics. It'll just say zoning. And I was joking. I was like, well, yeah, now enrollment's going to skyrocket. Right. Um, <laughs> but so I actually think zoning is so key to, I mean, it's, you know, as I argue uh, in the book for, for, the, for the worse, but it's so consumed planning. I, you know, I know so many people who go into planning um, maybe having like a, a sim city uh, framework of mm -hmm. what city planners do, right? And, and this is actually what, you know, planners maybe are good at and can, where they can really add value. Planning out streets, planning out infrastructure, planning out parks, planning out public services, mitigating environmental impacts. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people go into the profession wanting to do that type of work. And then, uh, you know, life comes at you fast and you're at a zoning, uh, you know, counter administering permits and, you know, telling the nice old lady <laughs> that she can't build an accessory dwelling unit, right? And so, um, mm. zoning is a really important, you know, I think it, even for planners who don't want to go into maybe land use planning, zoning is essential to understand because it just touches everything else. And mm. to the extent that we can have more people paying attention to this area of policy and asking smart questions, I think there's just a ton of upside here. Because I think it's actually one of the uniquely dysfunctional elements of American planning as it exists today. So, you know, I think there's a certain sense in which my book is is, is a critical project where I'm criticizing zoning as it exists today. But the, the last third of the book is really an open invitation to say, like, let's yeah. we don't have to yeah. be beholden to this institution for another 100 years. We can we can do better. Well, I, let's go on that topic and rewind, you know, 100, 120 years. And you heard me in the intro. So I, I wanted to go kind of in this line of health, safety and general welfare, mm -hmm. which is a clause you will find in any state enabling clause, any local zoning ordinance. What was zoning supposed to do from the start? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, this is the very like, maybe uh, AICP exam history that you get of zoning, I think, right? Uh, of like, there were oil refineries opening up next to single family homes, and there was tenement housing, and there was just sprawl happening without any control. And then, you know, we had to get the smartest men in the room to sit down and make a plan for 50 years. They're gonna write a zoning plan, and we're gonna solve these problems. Um, as I kind of cover in the book, I think you know zoning very quickly becomes untethered from that traditional health, safety, welfare justification, right? And it requires, I think, a subtle retooling. So I highlight, you know, as you all were talking about earlier in the conversation, the case of Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley is, you know, a lot of these zoning histories uh, focus on New York City, 1916 zoning ordinance, but I don't think that's very indicative of the typical zoning ordinance that we have today. I want to, I refocus on Berkeley, which I think is much more typical of what we would end up with. And Berkeley, of course, famously adopts single family zoning. And what single family zoning is trying to do is it, it has nothing to really do with those traditional impacts like smoke or noise or, or even to a certain extent traffic generation. Really what that's focused on is uh, essentially just limiting growth in certain areas and keeping those areas restricted to people of a certain class. And, and it's, you know, today I think these, those objectives get couched in technocratic terms or they get couched in, in you know, uh, even social justice terms in some, you know, California context. Um, but in Berkeley, you know, they just will say it very bluntly, like, yes, we are, we are trying to limit who can live here. Uh, and we are trying to, you know, put a basically minimum uh, floor on housing prices in certain areas of the city. And so, you know, I argue, you know, I think there's, there's one narrative about zoning of, oh, zoning's a good institution and we just misused it and it went bad. As I argue in the book, I think that from the very beginning, it's trying to do certain things that 
I don't think actually Lanny's planning should be doing or is not very good at doing. And that's why the systems failed. Yeah, so I mean, no. I kind of look at it of, uh, to, I, I, you know, here, we're going to approve this subdivision. It's a half mile from a school, but there's no sidewalks connecting <laughs> the two. But health, safety, and general welfare, we've met our goals. And I would say either the deviation or we have it uh, modified from it. So I can definitely relate to that in my experience and seeing people put in harm's way because of a zoning-based decision, despite health, safety, general welfare being at the top of that code. Mm -hmm. Nolan, I want to touch on uh, something I didn't know. Um, clearly, it's planning 101 that you understand the Euclid decision and that it was the foundation of all things zoning. And we, I think everybody understands that. But you included in your book a description from the Supreme Court justice who wrote the opinion and the word that they use to describe things and specifically that word being parasite. Mm. And that really struck me because I'm guessing you have some thoughts then on how could a Supreme Court decision that uses the word parasite to, mm -hmm. in this case, affirm a law, set the tone for this country for the next well to this day really so i just curious your thoughts on that especially as you explored this topic as you were doing your research you know it's funny i was talking to a buddy of mine from cleveland and uh i was thinking we were making a game plan for visiting cleveland i was like isn't euclid up there like euclid ohio and he's like yeah and i'm like i kind of want to visit uh euclid ohio and it's like it's kind of an unremarkable little suburb and i had to <laughs> explain to him like this because you can make a pilgrimage to the site um, and ironically enough, I mean, the whole case turned on blocking industrial on this lot, and now it's like a factory. Um, but the Euclid v. Ambler case is, I think, really important because, you know, I, th I think you're exactly right that it goes down in history. It's like, okay, this is when the Supreme Court said zoning was good, right? But if you actually read the case, what they're interrogating is, I think, some of the more unsavory elements of zoning. I mean, they're really targeting single family zoning in that case. And the Ambler folks are saying, like, there's actually no health, safety, welfare justification for having a residential zone, but then blocking maybe small multifamily, uh, right? And so that's what Euclid's having to argue. And that's where you get uh, Justice Sutherland saying, well, apartments are mere parasites, uh, right? Um, and saying like, these are just, these are just uh, draining the, you know, the qualities of uh, the, the public amenities and, and, and affluent. Uh, and of course, in that case, there's a, there's a strong ethnic and racial component uh, neighborhoods. Um, and so, you know, this is like, because this is what zoning is adding, right? So before Euclidean zoning comes into the picture, you know, cities had a lot of the elements of zoning that I think are significantly less controversial. Cities would have setbacks if you weren't using fireproof materials or or setbacks along, you know, a front setback to keep a consistent street frontage. Cities would say to noxious uses, hey, you cannot locate within so many feet of residential or schools or things like that, right? We had, there was a long history of that type of, the tenements, right? We had housing and building safety regulation. And so the question here is what is, what was zoning adding to that regulatory cocktail that we were already, we already had in place and that we were slowly improving to deal with a lot of these quality of life issues that cities had. And what zoning is adding to that is essentially this uh, framework of completely segregating all uses, uh, regardless of any maybe traditional externality, right? So we were very comfortable saying to the slaughterhouse, hey, you can't be in an existing city. But what zoning says is, well, now we want to be able to tell that to the corner deli, or we want to be able to say that mm. to the, the fourplex mm. in the single family area. And then also, as, in addition to this, just flat density restrictions, right? So saying, okay, only so much floor area can be built on any given lot, or only so many units can be built on every given lot not maybe tethered to a health and safety thing of saying like, okay, well, if you don't have water or sewer serving a lot and you're on well or septic, you have to, you can't have so many more units on a lot than X. That's, that's, those are lending these regulations that are really rooted in measurable health and safety outcomes. And zoning is essentially taking that and saying, well, we're kind of going to dispense with that. We're going to do a hit. We're going to say it's kind of rooted in health safety, broadly speaking. But if you scratch it, if you scratch at it even a little bit, which, you know, they very quickly do in the Euclid case, you find that other things are going on that I think a normal ethically well-adjusted person would be like, I don't know if like, that's really what, like, I want my local planning staff to be doing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Nolan. So you've shed light on how many places are actually more racially and economically segregated than ever yet. 
as a profession, planners are, we're all over that concept of equity and equality and social justice. Um, so what are we doing to address equity through zoning or what could we do? Kind of take that either way. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, and you know, it, it, can, it can get a little frustrating to me because I think this is like a classic conundrum in planning. You read the comp plan, the master plan, the general plan, you know, mm-hmm. it's called something in every other state. We have to be, we have to keep the plan, the local planners employed. Um, you open up the <laughs> comprehensive plan and it's got this like beautiful language about like, you know, we want to like all come together and sing Kumbaya and we want like everybody, we want to, we want a community that's high opportunity mm-hmm. and equitable and sustainable, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and actually too, to the extent that it's guiding infrastructure in many cases, or mm-hmm. to the extent that it's guiding service provisions, you know, good things are coming out of it. And then you, you, you put the, comprehensive plan aside and you open up the zoning ordinance and if you do it too quickly you get whiplash uh Mm -hmm. you know all of these high pollutant values that we talk about in many cases are not reflected in the actual zoning ordinances that are where the rubber hits the road on lanny's right right well you get at a thing we bring up in that is that if if a well-intended and a very good comprehensive plan doesn't lead to policy change Mm -hmm it might as well be written on an etch-a-sketch and yeah i think yeah. that's the norm instead of the exception then combined with here's 500 disparate goals in a comp plan yeah. so you mm. can justify any decision if it's not perfectly aligned with the zoning ordinance yeah oh you absolutely see that yeah i, I mean but and, and that's i think what you the games that get played when we try to fix this problem right so you your state might have a consistency requirement um but then the comp plan will say like, well, this is a general urban area, and um, it and it's so it's written so vaguely that like anything mm. can or can't be compliant with it uh, based on how the commissioners feel that day, or you know whether a council member got campaign funds from the developer, um, <laughs> right? Oh. But, but you see, I mean, this is a, so I, when I was writing the book, I was trying to pull together the critiques of zoning that I thought were most salient, and it was funny because when you go back and read a lot of the literature from the '70s and '80s, corruption is a big. Thing. Oh, and yeah. I mean, I'm in LA, oh, yeah. and we have like multiple council members who have been indicted by the by the FBI. Um, you know, <laughs> all, and it's it's invariably on land use stuff, right? Because we've created the system where that's another I think issue where with that's emerged with zoning is the rules are so binding in so many contexts that effectively everything needs discretionary relief, right? Almost yeah. every project needs a variance or a rezoning or a text amendment, mm-hmm. yeah, and so does. in that context, there's just so many opportunities for graft, um, and. Yeah. And so, or even if it's not, you know, hard graft of like what we recently had where like a duffel bag full of cash was being uh, pushed under, you know, a uh, a bathroom stall in Palm Springs, uh, campaign donations, right? Um, and this is, this actually, I think this lowers, I think the public's trust in planning too, by the way. Of course. Another, yeah. Well, I mean, we've had, we've had in cities we're very familiar with and have lived over time, you know, when you have somebody high in the planning department, somebody that just automatically in for some weird thing goes to work for the major developer and, yeah. and stuff mm. like that. And it could be the, the biggest thing on the most up and up, but it does make you kind of question that. And I know from my work in Chicago, that whole thing with 50 city council members and the way that city was structured, I think just, um, you know, just helped to fertilize that whole thing. So interestingly, in, in my life growing up in the South and then living in the West, I've kind of been in both that Sun Belt and the West, which are some of the places now that are seeing really the, the ills of, of this. What, what do you mm-hmm. see happening in the Phoenixes of the world and the Atlantas and, and what we're seeing here in places like Boise that have manifested themselves because of these inherent flaws in the zoning fixation? Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. I just had a piece come out in the Atlantic on this exact issue. Uh, so you know, I, I'm I'm current research director at California EMB, and California, you know, one of the benefits of having the most advanced housing crisis is that we're a little bit further along, I think, on some of the solutions, right? So over the last five or six years, we've legalized accessory dwelling units uh, statewide. We've created automatic buy right permitting processes for projects that you know have an affordability component or check other boxes or are going to be built in areas where we know we've agreed we want additional housing to be built. We're, we're gearing up to uh, remove uh, minimum parking mandates within proximity to transit. So we're doing a lot of these things. But you know what I found until the last two years or so is I would be talking to 
a state policymaker in a state like Tennessee or Utah. And I think, you know, there was like some awareness of this issue, but I think at the end of the day, there was this notion of like, well, that's just California. Those Democrats don't know how to run their state. I was talking to a Republican, for example. Um, but of course, now over the two years, it's an everywhere problem. I mean, every every major, almost every major metropolitan area in the country has a housing shortage. And and to the extent that they're still able to, able to build housing, it's mostly in areas where it actually adds additional planning hurdles, right? It's it's sprawl on the periphery that involves new infrastructure that's fiscally and environmentally unsustainable for cities. And they're saying, we want more infill, but they actually have zoning codes that are just as bad as a place like Los Angeles or, or Boston, right? Well, I look zoning. at it as, you know, here in Idaho, we pride ourselves on conservatism and fiscal conservatism mm -hmm. and everything about the land use that is being implemented here because of this growth is antithetical mm -hmm. to that. 100 yeah. percent because the burden it places on government and will force government to grow is a direct result of that and yeah it's as much as we bemoan californians in boise it's all based on that same stuff that's there so yeah that's that's totally the experience and why it why it gets framed as a political issue despite more reasonable growth policies and patterns being again one of the most fiscally conservative things we could possibly do well i'll share a brief war story and don knows this a little bit but a few years ago we were asked to pen a federal housing document that's a requirement of hud and it's this this concept of access to housing uh, and fair housing and I had never penned one before, but because of another sort of a lead in process that we were really good at, they wanted us to do this follow up. And through that process, I really quickly realized, in my opinion, the housing realm is just as bad as the transportation realm, because oh, yeah. there's so many obstacles to truth and so many obstacles to getting the, the needle to actually move that the only thing that people wanted to say that was access to housing was, well, there wasn't enough Spanish, um, you know, pamphlets in the lobby. And so therefore we need to really work on that kind of going, yeah, pretty sure that's the least of your problems. If <laughs> most of the people who are trying to find a place to live can't. For whatever the reason is, you know, or they have to go to the clear end of the other end of the valley in order to make that happen, you know, mm -hmm. without even batting an eye, the folks within the housing realm just, I think, just wanted to continue to lean on these same old cliche things, especially if it didn't mean doing any of the real hard, heavy lifting that you described in your book. Yeah, I, I, wanna... mean, I, I think this is a just real quick on this point, I mean, I think this is a problem, a cultural problem that we have in, in U.S. planning is there's a lot of focus on process. There's a lot of focus on doing the study, doing the equity study. Uh, there's not a lot of focus on, well, do we get the equity outcomes? Like, do we get the outcome? Yeah. What, what's our what's our target? Yeah. What's the metric that we're pursuing? What's our target for that mm -hmm. metric? Did we achieve that? Yes or no. If not, what do we need to do? What policies need to change? to achieve yeah. that, right? Like the way that you run the rest of your life, you're like, I want to lose some weight. This is what I was, what weight I want to be in on this date. Okay. This is my plan. To, I'm going to do the, you know, I don't need to do a study, right. Of like, if I do the study on how to lose weight and then I don't do any of the stuff, right. Like I've got some bad news. Um, but this he is, just, you know, we're so, we're so yeah. focused on process as opposed to substantive reforms or even outcomes. You just and what's the amazing. cockles of the inner personal, uh, personal trainer of Chris's heart there with that yes, analogy. Yes, so I know he would yes, use Yes, you that. did. Yes, you did. I just, I just had to say, and what's amazing about this focus on process, and it has to be done that, you know, and it has to be done this way because this is the rules. This is just like, well, but we wrote those rules and there was, you know, what was, why? We forgot to ask, why is that rule in place? Does it still work? Things change, things shift. I mean, I'm not using, hey, let's be fair. The iPhone wasn't around, you know, when I was a kid. And today, if 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 somebody doesn't have one, I'm upset because their bubbles are green and not blue on the, my screen. I mean, like, I have some real silly problems, but I just I I I I really think the other thing is is that in housing, for some reason, the way that 
we're writing these um, policies and procedures and things or the way that they are and we're having to follow them, it's almost through the perspective of, well, this is what an American wants. We want a single family home with a yard and a dog and a fence and all these things. And I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a single person living in 1400 square feet in downtown Orlando, Florida. Why? Well, this is about as small as I can find um, unless I live in an apartment complex, which is more expensive than like a home, for example, which in the realm of, of, of talking about why that makes fiscal sense, it, it doesn't. I think the apartment complex is probably making some money, uh, whereas uh, the only people making money with my house is maybe my mortgage uh, lender. <laughs> so, well, I, mean, I mean, this it, is a it's, funny thing. On this point, I mean, this is you know, every now and then I'll be talking to some council members say like, you know, hey, um, you can put a huge dent in part of these problems, build that apartment building next to the transit station. And uh, and they'll say like, oh, that's going to be a huge fiscal drain. And I'm like, OK, 200 young professionals who don't have kids and are going to be paying local sales taxes and they're going to hop on a train and commute to the city and come back at night. They are not a fiscal drain. That is free money for your municipality. Mm -hmm. But that's, I mean, this is another thing too. I think, I think a point that you're kind of getting at there is like, there's a lot of uh, just bogus assumptions that were inherited about like right. what types of development lose money or what types of development make money. Like you, you talk to some, uh, I'll talk to people in the Sun Belt and they're like, oh yeah, we have to uh, permit that. Um, you know, w like we've zoned all of our all of our green fields for uh, mansions on acre lots. Uh, because those make money and I'm like there is no you're playing pipe and water for that and you're paving road there's no way that makes money especially if they have kids all right and that's yeah. that's I mean American planning we all know this that's the that's the worst an oil refinery can move in that's great that's that's tax revenue but kids oh gosh like they're the ultimate impact um from a you know fiscal zoning perspective um but you know I I'll say that I mean I think another point too here is choice right so I think you know I think there's a certain type of planner who approaches this with a very take your, your eat your vegetables take your medicine approach of like well sorry sorry folks uh, housing's expensive and you know we got to get we got to get the emissions down and you know we got to do all this other stuff sorry we're gonna have to build some townhouses we're gonna have to build some apartments um i'd say that's a great thing your, your community should have a range of housing options you know something i find so many americans are finding especially as they enter retirement age they don't they don't have a place to downsize in their neighborhood there's not right. a town. There's not yeah. a townhouse within 30 minutes of them. There's not a, a condo within 30 minutes of mm -hmm. them. So when you want to, if you want to downsize, that essentially means leaving your community, leaving mm -hmm. your network. Or you know, in the case of California, this is something I find a lot. Is yeah, may, if you're a California homeowner, you bought your home in the 1970s for like two magic beans, and now it's worth five million dollars. <laughs> in one sense, you won, but in another sense, your kid can't afford to live anywhere near you. Mm -hmm. uh, and if if that that adult kid, you're never going to see your grandkids. All of your friends and colleagues are cashing out and moving away. Um, in one sense, moving to yeah, Boise. Okay. <laughs> moving to Boise. Yeah, and Trust then displacing, me on that. displacing a Boisean because Boise doesn't want to make similar zoning reforms, right? So it's it really is like a you know a, a domino effect here. Well, it gets at that other Idaho thing we talk about of it. It limits freedom. Yet all we talk about is freedom. And that example you had of you know that the empty nesters that can't even stay in their own community where they built roots simply because. There's not the ability to downsize. So, well, we're going to move quickly into the. Uh, before lighting. we do that, oh yeah, yeah. We, I want to. I want to make sure we ask uh, some positive stuff because oh. your book, <laughs> we we've wow. really we have really I, I think been hitting on the downside uh, mm -hmm. of zoning and all of the negative effects. Your book definitely illustrates changes that are possible things that can be done so i'm going to ask you a question but i want to make sure I, I i need to get to something in here that struck me um a second part of your intro here but attracted to the profession of high ideals many planners have lost faith in the project of planning as it exists today this is particularly true of the lowly land use planner a creature reduced to managing rezoning paperwork for an anachronistic zoning code and meekly taking notes as a motley crew of busybodies take turns shouting at them over a zoning variance. Man, you just described <laughs> so like my many... whole career. <laughs> 
so many P, P and Z meetings, city council meetings, <laughs> and you you kind of laid it out there, right? For better or worse. And I know there's some people who are going to listen to this going, what the heck? Is, you know, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. So where am I going with that? I'm going with because you kind of come back and I think to your credit, go, wait a minute. There's hope, right? There's a lot of hope here. And you are needed. Your knowledge and expertise is needed. It just doesn't have to be through zoning. And to my surprise, you started to get into, you get a lot into the city of Houston, especially over the last few years in particular, because of how much infill and density and things that you're seeing. And so that's where I would like for us to end this discussion is fill the sails of that lowly land use planner that you described, right? What, how do we need them in the future? And what are some of the real possible, I don't know if I want to call them silver bullets. I think that's a bit of a stretch, but what are some of those things Things that are being done or could be done to get us to a better place. Would you even call it a toolkit for success? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. Don't, don't do that. that. No, <laughs> no consulting speak will be tolerated. <laughs> this at all. Good, um, thank you. Perfect. Uh, uh, fr framework for, yeah, yeah. Uh, thankfully I had an editor who scrubbed all of that planning language out. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 but the point I'm trying to make in that maybe somewhat flowery section that you picked out is that I do think actually one of the costs of the of the status quo is that we end up wasting a lot of talent. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I th I don't actually think people appreciate how high quality the, their typical planning office is. I mean, you have incredibly sharp people uh, who have a lot of technical expertise and who care deeply about their communities. Right? These are people who like if they were just in it for the money, they could easily go private sector or they could go into some other field and do just fine. Um, but a lot of people go into the profession because they care deeply about their communities and their neighborhoods and they want to make cities a better place. Um, I contend, of course, as we've talked about, that, that zoning is a misapplication of a lot of that talent. But we absolutely need planners, I think, to to do a lot of the important work. I, one, I mean, just sticking to land use, I actually do, you know, there's an important role for the state to play in regulating externalities or spillover effects, right? Things like noise or traffic generation uh, or or light pollution, these are important issues. Uh, the market's going to fail to resolve a lot of them because there's spillover effects. Planners can can get sophisticated about that stuff. You know, I use the example of noise ordinances, right? Noise is one of these great quality of life issues. And I think it's actually lurking in the background on a lot of land use fights, right? So like when there's a rezoning to allow commercial for a corner grocery, somebody will be at that meeting saying, oh, but what if it turns into a bar and the bar is noisy, um, right? And so like, or, you know, people will be speculating, you know, you see, or like, oh, like, what if the, what if this use comes in and then it ends up having, it ends up generating all of this traffic. I would contend like the, the way to do land use planning that actually addresses those concerns is to say, well, okay, here's, here are the impacts that we'll tolerate. Here's how we're going to regulate them. Here's how we're going to provide a system of incentives or fees to get people to internalize some of this behavior. That's, you know, regu this is the general overarching theme, I think, is regulate the things that people actually really care about. And you can dispense with a lot of this other stuff that's sort of been smuggled into zoning over the last 100 years. Mm. I think planning also, I mean, we're not gonna build equitable cities, uh, you know, completely on our own right here. Uh, you're gonna have to have policies that make sure that we have housing for people maybe at the bottom of the market who aren't gonna be served by the market. Or you're gonna have to have programs to try to encourage affordable housing to go into places that are high opportunity where the market might not be able to, you know, build maybe cheaper forms of housing. Um, physical planning, I think, is absolutely important. And I actually don't think it's kind of fallen by the wayside over the last 100 years. I think zoning has has so overwhelmed planning that a lot of this nuts and bolts planning work of like, hey, let's just sit down and draw out what the streets are going to look like. Mm -hmm. A lot of cities don't even have streets plans, right? And well, it goes people, back a lot of the our best form or places we would look at as best came about pre-zoning, right? Right. Right. Well, and this is, I think, a really subtle but important distinction is uh, disentangling zoning and planning. I mean, humans have been doing planning since we started settling in one place, right? I mean, you you have, you know, the modern Western city planning begins with the ancient Greeks who are setting up colonies. And the first thing they do is they draw out a street grid and they say, here's where the uh, the agora in the marketplace is going to be, right? That And that type of work is actually really important. And a lot of cities actually don't even really do that type of work. I mean, they don't, they don't have a streets plan and they maybe have a very vague plan for like where future parks and public services are going to be. But it's very much just like, yeah, we're, whatever developer comes in and they can build their cul-de-sacs and their winding streets and there's not going to be a street network and we'll just figure it out ex post facto. But, but as they're sort of willy-nilly about 
being stewards of the public realm, which I actually think is the most important job planners have, they're micromanaging the details of that of all development on the private lot, right? So they're saying like, well, yeah, we don't really care what the street network really looks like, but uh, we do want to count up how many parking lots you have in the strip mall, or um, you know, oh, we do want to like make sure that the you know the angle of the front gable is uh, is correct, right? <laughs> I would argue that this is just a misallocation of talent. And planners have a hugely important role to be playing in doing that type of physical planning, that type of environmental planning, that type of housing planning, and that's where I think we actually can really use this incredible capacity that we have in a way that actually builds affordable, equitable, and sustainable cities. Yeah, perfect. I mean, yeah, I, I, so much in that statement for episode. So yeah. I told you this is a conversation that we between the four of us, man. Not at a planning conference, apparently though, because I don't know. It's a bunch of mouth breathing. Well, I you know, you get my point, but well I'm gonna deviate a little as we kick off the lightning round. What's the biggest piece of pushback you've gotten on this book? Oh, that's a great question. Um yeah, I think there are a few um, dumb misreadings of the book. Uh, if I can, I mean, we, you know, we're about to go into the whiskey lightning round. The first is that I suggest that abolishing zoning is a panacea. Um, absolutely not. I mean, I, I, I think that moving beyond zoning is a necessary but not sufficient condition for building the type of cities that we want. I, as I argue in the book, it, it's broken, it hasn't worked. But that's not, you know, get rid of zoning and, you know, we enter the promised land. That's we get rid of zoning and then it becomes easier to solve some of these other problems. Right. So when you don't have a zoning code that makes it impossible to build housing, it's easier to solve homelessness. Or when you don't have a zoning code that forces you to build tons of parking, it gets easier to start doing real transportation planning and building communities that are, you know, have a range of mobility options. So it's a it's a first step on a reform program. I'd say the second I do talk about Houston and I think Houston's a really fascinating case. Um, I'm not offering Houston as an all-purpose planning model. In fact, I, I say this in the book, Houston made just about every other planning mistake you could have made in the 20th century, right? Um, it's a beautiful city, I love it, but you know they built the urban freeways. They you know, they mandated a lot of the parking. They, um, they did some of the bad urban renewal, right? They were very callous about wetlands development, absolutely. But as I argue in the book, I think there's overwhelming evidence that they're the one mistake that they didn't make to not adopt zoning actually has paid off really well for the city. It's very easy for infill development to happen in Houston. There's a reason why Houston, despite explosive growth, both in terms of population and income over the last 25, 30, 40 years, has still remained one of the most affordable and diverse cities in the country mm -hmm. as places like Los Angeles are now in population decline or places like San Francisco basically lose their entire African-American population because that, that, those communities just get displaced. Yeah. They're moving to working class and people of color from all over the country are moving to a place like Houston and that's partly enabled by just having a flexible land use planning framework. And again, and I would say too, it's like it. I think it gets confused of just a absence of zoning as an yeah. absence of regulation. And I think mm -hmm. you're where you first started this conversation of we've had regulations for a long time. And my experience with you know doing the same kind of study of Houston is that's been the piece of it. And I would also say. I, the first time I did it, I'm like, is that downtown? Is that downtown? No, is that downtown? No, there's a lot of high density nodes in that place that I think of the result um, of that. So I think we're going to finally kick off the uh, light, much promised lightning round here. We've, we've gone on a long time, which has been great. Jess? Yeah. So tell me what rocks about Kentucky? Oh, um, Kentucky quietly has a huge amount of cultural soft power. I mean, it's, yeah. Well, I'll start with a story. I was in um, I was in Guatemala and um, I was talking to somebody in uh, very rudimentary English, right? Or um, you know, we're, so I'm speaking in broken Spanish and they're speaking in broken English. And uh, I tell them, <laughs> uh, they ask where I'm from, and I say Kentucky, and they're like, ask it again, like uh, uh, Kentucky. Somebody else came over and was like, oh, he thought you were talking about the fast food restaurant. He didn't realize Kentucky was the place. Um, <laughs> so it's like, amazing. Wow. You know. Kentucky Fried Chicken, bourbon, horse racing, uh, bluegrass. You know, Kentucky's That's just right. a crazy cultural exporter, uh, despite being a pretty small and poor place, which yeah, I just think is yeah. incredible. Well, we live in a place where a city nearby wanted to preserve the Kentucky Fried Chicken spinning bucket as like a historic preservation type of a thing. Shut. So, yeah, you know, not a, I'm not moving a full there to vote it. There. I'm yeah, doing it. Was, <laughs> it was the tallest structure in town yeah, right. for a long time. Oh. Yeah. So, I got to ask you, Nolan, as someone who grew up in LA area, you know, you went from I think it was Kentucky to New York, and then to to DC, and then I think that's the the the, the line. What shocked you about Los Angeles? 
Um, I uh, so honestly, I've been the, the weather is just so nice. I, I honestly think I'm kind of trapped in LA because it's <laughs> it's 70 degrees and sunny every day. I remember, so I grew up in Kentucky, right? And in Kentucky, like in a lot of the U.S., if it's 70 and sunny, there's like a tacit understanding. Everybody goes home from work. Uh, just relax. You have to be outside. Do not be inside like for one minute, right? Right. Um, and I, I think this is how it is. And most of you know, when it's seventy and sunny out, you go out and you make the most of it because it just doesn't happen. And I remember when I I was I'd been in LA for a few weeks and I was doing some work in my apartment and I look outside and it's like clear skies and I look at the temperature and it's seventy. I'm like, what? Am, I can't work today. I need to go out and enjoy this. And I had to, I literally had to reset expectations of like, well, yeah, it was like this yesterday and it's gonna be like this tomorrow. Um, LA has a lot of problems, but there's a reason why people put up with them. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> what was the reaction from the publisher when you said, I've got an idea, book about zoning? Well, you know, I mean, so I'm happy to talk about the process of publishing a book because it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a big ordeal. Uh, but uh, yeah, I had a great press with Island Press. They immediately understood my vision for the book. Uh, I think they... I think they were picking up on some of what I was picking up on, which is they were like, yeah, we keep, we keep seeing stuff about zoning and editorial pages, or we keep seeing, you know, state and local political campaigns having opinions on zoning and there's just not a good go-to book on it. Yeah, so they seem uh, to be a really good company at, at that. And that's kind of where a lot of this stuff I see coming out of. Island Press is fantastic. I, I, I had somebody asked me, they were like, is there a monthly subscription service where I can just get whatever books come out from <laughs> Island Press? Cause they're doing great, but you know, it, it did take that. I did talk to a few editors where, you know, cause it, finding a press, finding a press for your book is like dating, you know, you're like, so what kind of book are you looking for? Well, this is the kind of book I'm trying to write, you know, like you're, you're feeling the person out. You're like, are we compatible? Uh, so, you know, there, you know, there were a few people who were like, zoning's too weird. Can't you just write a book on like city planning or, you know, mm -hmm. or, or folks who wanted or, or academic presses where it's like, can't this just be a giant lit review of, all the research that's been done on zoning. And I was like, well, that's not really my vision, but it was great. It was love at first sight uh, to, to carry out the metaphor with Island Press. Well, speaking of love, how about we talk about Kentucky whiskey? What is, in your opinion, the most underappreciated whiskey that comes out of tech Kentucky? Uh, that's really tough. I'm going to, I'm going to give uh, an answer that actually <laughs> answers this question. And I'm going to give a, a, a clever answer here. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. I'm, I just like bullet as a good mid shelf, uh, mix in, drink it straight. Uh, it's good for the price. Um, lately I've been drinking a lot of Zacapa, which is rum that's aged in bourbon barrels. Yes. Mm. Uh, and I love well, that. Well, you stuff. did move I to LA, so you have to start participating <laughs> with more tequila. I think it's only natural. It's much more popular in Los Angeles. I just went to Grand Forks, North Dakota and saw the most extensive whiskey menu on a, uh, on a, in a, in a, in a restaurant. I, and I'm like, North Dakota, why in the world? But I couldn't believe it. So I think tequila is uh, having its moment as well. Hmm. Yeah, well, I need I know... some bourbon barrel aged tequila. I'll keep an eye out for oh, that. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, I know gosh. for for us and kind of the consternations we've had in the profession, I, I you know, as, as we kind of wrap this up, I mean, do you uh, see yourself as the Martin Luther of zoning now? <laughs> 99 you know, complaints. <laughs> yeah, they're just tacked up on the city it's, hall door. <laughs> it's the Reformation, right? I mean, right. it's... <laughs> banging this on the LA city hall front door, right? Um, yeah. Are you going to you know, write I'd... planning code in the, in the language of the people? This, this is what, <laughs> this is true. I could do this all day. <laughs> we have to keep the planners employed. We can't have anyone able to understand what's in the zoning code. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> I mean, there is a sense in which, you know, the, the project of the book is to sort of move the conversation forward. Uh, you know, I, uh, try as I might, I don't think cities are going to go out and abolish their zoning codes tomorrow, but we can take, I think, baby steps toward changes that get you some of those benefits, you know, remove some of the most onerous zoning barriers, build up your your planning capacity where people actually care about it, right? Um, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, hopefully I don't kick off like 300 years of civil wars, uh, like the, the Reformation, <laughs> but that wouldn't be so bad if we got no zoning on the other end, right? I didn't think of that yeah. part. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the long view. That's the long view. Come on. Oh, I think you have. I, I think there's going to be some planning conferences that will crack this. If they're smart, they'll, if future ones, national, state, what have you, will really start to take a little edgier approach and make it interesting, right? And and it's amazing. It just occurred to me, 
why hasn't the APA had a national conference in Euclid, Ohio? Like you would think like <laughs> that might not be a bad idea, right? Like if you're, I mean, go, especially right now, right? That the Supreme court case, but anyway, gosh, what a oh, conversation. It's and amazing. <laughs> so many things that we've gotten out of it. Uh, Nolan, we appreciate your time. We thank you for your efforts, your work, as well as your your current profession there in, in California in the Yimby movement. And yes, in my backyard, right, which is something that I know works uh, firsthand. I can testify that that helps get projects approved. So your efforts in, in trying to get more and more people to think that way and then also reflect on this little thing that we call zoning. Um, what a what an Herculean effort that you undertook, and we certainly appreciate it uh, and appreciate your time today. So thank you for joining us uh, on our podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Fun conversation. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, with that, commissioners, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Awesome. Well, we'll see you on the flip side. Thank you all for listening, and uh, we'll continue to try harder. Appreciate your time. Thank you.